Good morning. My welcome again to all of you for the beginning of the second day of the Nobel Conference Program. In keeping with our tradition of so honoring those Nobel laureates who participate in our conferences, we will begin this morning's program with the conferral of an honorary degree on Professor Tobin. To begin those proceedings, I call on Dean David Johnson. From time to time, Gustavus Adolphus pauses for a high occasion, the awarding of an honorary doctorate. It is a time for this college to assert, through the persons we choose to honor, that for which we wish to be known. One of those ways is to exalt scholarship. And we do so today by the honoring of a recipient of the Memorial Prize in Economics in honor of Alfred Nobel, Dr. James Tobin, who will be awarded the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. I ask the platform party to step forward. John Bungham will be the citator, Elaine Brostrom, and John Holte, the lictors for this occasion. Mr. President, today we honor James Tobin, Sterling Professor of Economics and a recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics. James Tobin, born and raised in Champaign, Illinois, earned all of his academic degrees at Harvard University. He was one of the first students selected for Harvard's National Scholars Program in 1935, graduating summa cum laude in 1939. A year later, he received a master's degree, which was followed by service with the Office of Price Administration in Washington, D.C. From 1942 to 1945, he served in the United States Navy, where he earned the gold watch, an award given to the best officer in the training class. Returning to Harvard following the war, he completed his Ph.D. and was elected into the Valhalla of the Society of Fellows a society from which many tenured professors at Harvard are selected. But Yale called in 1950, and he, along with Lloyd Reynolds, proceeded to transform a very conservative department of economics into what Paul Samuelson called the best Harvard department outside of Cambridge, to which Alvin Hansen, in response, said, Yale is the best Harvard department, period. Uh, since 1957, he has been the Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale University. Dr. Tobin's accomplishments are legion. In 1955, he received the John Bates Clark Medal, an award given by the American Economics Association to the individual generally recognized as the most promising young scholar in the field. He was director of the Cowles Foundation for Research in Economics from 1955 to 1961 and chairman of the Department of Economics at Yale University during two different time periods. He served on the Council of Economic Advisors with Walter Heller and Kermit Gordon in 1961 and 1962 during Kennedy's presidency. He has been a consultant to the Board of Governors at the Federal Reserve System on numerous occasions, as well as a consultant to the United States Treasury. Finally, he was awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics in 1981. Professor Tobin's contributions to the academic discipline of economics are wide-ranging and generally concern the interactions of real and financial variables in the determination of national income in the short run and the long run. More specifically, he is the chief architect of portfolio selection theory this theory analyzes changes in financial markets and how they influence the spending and investing habits of individuals and businesses. As he explains it, it is simply a theory of not putting all your eggs in one basket because if something goes wrong, you lose all of them at once. 
He has also written uh, seminal papers on empirical and theoretical aspects of consumption and saving behavior, business investment, and econometric methods, and is considered, along with Paul Samuelson, as co-developer of the neoclassical synthesis of Keynesian and classical economics. While self-described as an ivory tower economist, the underlying theme of Tobin's work has been that the whole purpose of the economy is the production of goods and services for present or future consumption. For Tobin, it is without question that full employment is the primary objective of economic policy, and the burden of proof is always on those who would leave idle men, machines, or land in pursuit of some other objective. President Kendall, I have the greatest pleasure to present to you, upon recommendation of the faculty at Gustavus Adolphus College, James Tobin, for the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. On the recommendation of the faculty of this college, with the approval of its Board of Trustees, and by virtue of the authority vested in this institution by the State of Minnesota, I hereby confer upon you, James Tobin, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa with all of the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereto appertaining. Well, thank you very much for the generous uh, award. The <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, be here for this uh, symposium, award or not. And I hope you excuse me for uh, disrobing uh, just now. It got a little warm here yesterday. Uh, in the citation, it uh, uh, quoted my description of uh, my great theory that you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, I want to explain that. On the uh, great day in uh, 1981, when uh, I got the word from the uh, press that uh, it's early in the morning in, in uh, the Northeast United States when this happened, uh, that I was going to get the uh, Nobel Award. Uh, I hadn't yet received the uh, official information from uh, Baron Rammel, <laughs> but uh, what happened is uh, various radio and uh, press uh, people in New York uh, get it on the wire and they call you up. Indeed, one of them called the Yale switchboard that morning and uh, asked, for the, uh, asked for the number of James Tobin and uh, called the number, and a uh, sleepy uh, voice answered, and the reporter said, congratulations, uh, uh, you have just been awarded the uh, Nobel Prize in Economics. And the voice said, are you sure of that? He said, I'm, I'm only a sophomore. <laughs> and, uh, it's the, The implication that if he'd been a senior, it would have been perfectly natural <laughs> it's just a, uh, perhaps goes with uh, Yale students. But later that morning, uh, 
I had to go to a press conference, which the university uh, public relations office kindly organized. And uh, so not knowing why I was being given this award, uh, they said, well, we see something in this uh, press announcement about portfolio theory. You want to tell us what that's about. So I explained what that was about in uh, the best uh, language for laypersons that I could uh, imagine, after which the reporters said, uh, oh no, you please explain it in language that's understandable to laypersons. <laughs> so that's when I said, well, you know, it's uh, not putting all your eggs in one basket. And then I received from uh, several uh, alleged friends of mine a cartoon which appeared uh, around the country which showed a, a man of a certain age uh, standing at a rostrum like this and uh, saying, well, uh, here is why I received last year's Nobel Award in medicine. A doc an apple a day keeps the doctor away. <laughs> So, <clears throat> now a couple of weeks ago, the uh, celebration of the 350th birthday of uh, Harvard, a symposium there on Harvard and Keynesian economics. There are all kinds of, uh, of uh, symposia and programs of this kind in these days, uh, anniversaries of uh, this or that, including Keynes' general theory. And <clears throat> uh, so, of course, when uh, uh, Keynes was uh, writing and living, there was no Nobel Prize in economics. But uh, let's hope he would have uh, got it if, uh, if there had been. Uh, given that the Swedes were in charge, uh, he probably, probably would have. Uh, although there were a few Swedish economists who uh, felt that uh, they'd already done uh, Keynesian economics uh, before the general theory came along, only they published it in, in uh, the esoteric languages like uh, Swedish and German. Anyway, uh, I had been to the uh, 300th anniversary of uh, Harvard when I was a sophomore, like that other James Tobin. And I knew that th at that occasion they had given honorary degrees to 62 of eminent scholars from around the world. So it occurred to me to wonder what they had done about economists that day. So I looked it up. and. Uh, sure enough, they had not honored Keynes, even though the general theory had been published on February 6th, as Jeff Harcourt told us, and the celebration was in September of that year. Uh, they did, however, honor three economists, one of whom was from uh, Keynes' hometown and home university, in Cambridge, England. But it was uh, Dennis Robertson, who was a friend and uh, rival of, of Keynes uh, at the time. My further research disclosed that Keynes received only one honorary degree in America of any time. Uh, that was from Columbia, and that was given prior to his uh, writing of the general theory. Um, I think that uh, not many books are celebrated 50 years after their publication, and uh, even fewer deserve to be. In the golden anniversary of uh, Keynes's general theory of employment, interest, and money is also a golden anniversary for me, personally, because shortly after that, 300th birthday at Harvard, I started studying economics 50 years ago, and it happened I cut my teeth on Keynes's new book. That was because I had a young tutor, uh, who was also my introductory economics instructor, 
who uh, had been in England and who was sort of crazy. And he said, well, for tutorial, uh, there's this new book from England that some people think might be important, so let's you and I read it. Well, I was too young, age of 19, and too ignorant to know that I was too young and ignorant to read that book. Uh, so I did read it, and uh, it was pretty exciting. And it was my introduction to theoretical reasoning in economics and to controversy in economics, as well as to diagnosis and prescription for the world's ills during the Great Depression. So I learned Keynesian economics at that age, and many people think I've learned nothing since. Uh, although the initial response of the economics establishment to that book was mostly negative, younger members of the profession rallied enthusiastically to the Keynesian standard fairly quickly, especially at Harvard. And at Harvard, they found a mentor in uh, Professor Alvin Hansen, who became the leading apostle and interpreter of Keynes in America. I mention him not just because he was uh, my admired teacher and uh, dear friend, but also because he came from these prairies. He grew up in South Dakota, and before he went east to Harvard in 1937, he was a distinguished professor at the University of Minnesota. His initial response to Keynes's book was critical, but on the train to Boston, so to speak, he changed his mind. It's rare for anyone to change his mind about anything anytime, and especially at the age of 50. Well, ironically, just as Minnesota was via Hansen involved in the Keynesian Revolution, so it is involved in the current counter-revolutions against Keynes. The University of Minnesota has become a major center, perhaps the major center, of the new classical macroeconomics, a powerful theoretical attack on Keynesian economics. I wanted to um, uh, begin by uh, a little history. Uh, in the 1920s, after the First World War, uh, Britain was in depression. <clears throat> And the question was, a question was, uh, whether after having suspended the gold standard during the war, that Britain should return to the gold standard at the same value of the pound in terms of gold and in terms of the dollar as had existed in 1914. The Chancellor of the Exchequer was a man named Winston Churchill, and there was J.M. Keynes, a <coughs> private citizen, he uh, thought it was a great mistake to return to uh, the pre-war value of the pound because it, given the uh, wartime inflation and increase in costs in Britain, it would make British exports uh, uncompetitive. And he predicted that if it were done, Britain would go into depression. <coughs> uh, nevertheless, Churchill, supported by the economics establishment of the time, uh, did return to the gold standard at the pre-war parity of $4.86 per pound. And things happened just the way Keynes said they would. And Britain went into a depression long before the rest of the uh, advanced capitalist world, high rates high amounts of unemployment and rates of unemployment for a long time. 1929, uh, Keynes still thought something should be done about the unemployment. And in the uh, electoral campaign of that year, he uh, made up with his old enemy, Lloyd George, and supported a program of uh, public works to give jobs with uh, borrowing the funds to do so. Uh, <clears throat> George, Lloyd George was the liberal uh, leader. He lost the election. The result 
the proposal, however, resulted in an uh, interesting and extensive debate about economic policy, macroeconomic policy, in which the British Treasury, supported by the uh, establishment of economists of the day, uh, said that there was no room in the economy for public works. That's essentially what they said, and that trying to do so would simply cause inflation. So you could not create more jobs by borrowing money and spending it, because they would simply displace uh, private jobs which were more productive. That was called the Treasury View, and it prevailed. The next thing uh, Keynes wanted to do was to uh, uh, devalue the pound and rectify the uh, mistake of 1925. And wouldn't do that either until forced to do so by uh, <clears throat> events in uh, 1931, at which time uh, Britain began to pull out of the recession depression earlier than, uh, than other countries. Uh, much the same effects of the devaluation as uh, Baron Rammel uh, told us from Swedish experience uh, in more recent years last night. In the United States, in the same period, during the Great Depression, uh, the Depression, as it got worse in the early 30s, began to unbalance the federal budget. You get to collect less taxes when incomes go down. Uh, President Hoover, therefore, proposed to raise taxes to balance the budget, to keep it in balance. And Roosevelt attacked Hoover for having an unbalanced budget nevertheless, in uh, the 32 campaign, and he raised taxes the first year or two of the Roosevelt administration. Now, even President Reagan knows now that it's a bad idea to raise taxes and kick the economy when it's already down. But that's what they did, and that was the uh, economic wisdom of the time, the economic orthodoxy of the time. There were also some proposals at the time that the Federal Reserve should take more active steps to uh, lower interest rates and increase uh, uh, money supplies. The Hoover administration was scared that that might happen, and so that the Federal Reserve, Congress might even pass a law which said they have gotta do that. And they fought against that law, and who supported them in doing so? The economics establishment of the day. That that would be inflationary and unsound. Let's go to Germany. In uh, Germany, uh, of course, there was very high unemployment during the Great Depression and uh, getting worse all the time. We're in the latter days of the Weimar Republic. The chancellor is a you know, nice man named uh, Heinrich Brüning. Uh, he is concerned, however, about uh, the reputation of uh, Germany in the international money market and uh, about uh, <clears throat> going further into uh, public and international debt, and he refused to do anything to raise the uh, unemployment compensation, relieve the distress increasing in a period of extremely high unemployment, or to uh, have public works jobs or anything like that. In an election shortly following this uh, episode, uh, the Weimar Republic was destroyed forever. Hitler became the chancellor, and. Bruning went to exile at Harvard. <clears throat> now there's a mythology which says the reason for Hitler coming into power in Germany was the inflation, the, inflation, the great hyperinflation, but that occurred in 1923. And after that, Germany was prosperous. It's really more to the point to say that the unemployment, depression, and the failure of the government to do anything about it was immediate cause. Now Keynes's book in coming in 1936 gave some intellectual coherence to the uh, few voices in the economics profession which had been instinctively and pragmatically inclined to support measures to do something about this disaster. I mean, it really is a, uh, a striking thing when whole petitions from 
the leading members of the profession opposed those measures in uh, the United States, for example, in those years. Keynes realized, I believe, that his uh, instinctive, pragmatic proposals in the 20s and early 30s were not supported by a coherent uh, theoretical and intellectual uh, development. And the general theory of employment, interest, and money written in 1936 was designed to do that. Uh, I don't think uh, we Keynesians have to apologize or be defensive. After the Second World War, in all democratic capitalist societies, there was a great resolution, determination in the uh, popular opinion and the politics of the day that we should not have a Great Depression again. And there was a fear that that's what would happen. Uh, when the uh, artificial stimulus of the war itself was removed. And as a result of that determination, the governments uh, on both sides of the Atlantic uh, became uh, committed to activist policies to sustain high employment and to damp the perennial business cycle. Baron Ramel described the Swedish commitment and its success in Keynesian terms in his country last night. There was similar commitment in Britain and in the United States. In the United States it was embodied in the Employment Act of 1946. It was weaker than in Sweden to be sure, but it's also true that every administration has used Keynesian activist policies to an attempt to stabilize uh, cyclical fluctuations since the Second World War, to greater or lesser degree. Uh, and even when they were at pains, as the present administration is, to deny that they are Keynesian. Well, and what's the result? Or at least the coincidence. We never can be sure about what's cause and what's effect. Well, GNP growth has been higher on average in this country, in the European countries, throughout the free world, than in ever any similar length period in recorded economic history. The volatility of, of uh, output and real income year to year has been about a third of what it was before the Second World War. And even if you leave out the Great Depression as a aberrant period, the business cycle has been substantially tamed relative to the period before the 1930s. Uh, and throughout the free world, there has been an unprecedented prosperity, growth of GMP and of international trade. In the late 60s, we ran into some troubles, that's to be sure. The Vietnam War led to a rise in inflation in the United States from around 2% or less to around 5%. Now, 5% doesn't sound like a disaster, but it was so regarded in 1969. I mean, if Paul Volcker declared victory over inflation in 1982 when the inflation rate got down to 5%. Well, anyway, uh, the events during that Vietnam War period in the late 1960s were no surprise to Keynesian economists. President Johnson was being advised by Keynesian economists who told him that financing the Vietnam War without raising taxes or taking other uh, restrictive measures would be inflationary because the economy was already at uh, as low a rate of unemployment as was consistent with avoiding inflation, already at full employment. They told him that, and he de declined their advice for political reasons, and the tax increase was substantially delayed. Do you hold that against Keynesian economics? I don't know. Uh, in the 1970s, it's true that uh, the breakdown of uh, Bretton Woods and the beginning of the floating rate system led to a world commodity inflation, as uh, Axel Leon Hoof had said last night, or yesterday. But that was not wholly the fault of the United States mismanagement. The Germans and the Japanese had the choice 
at the time between appreciating their exchange rate or taking as many dollars as they would get at their existing undervalued exchange rates, and they chose to do the latter in the interest of their exporters. Following that, we had the OPEC uh, shocks, two of them, two substantial shocks, unprecedented in their nature and magnitude in peacetime economic history, modern times. Now talk about missing words in yesterday's uh, presentations. As Les Thoreau said, he didn't hear the speakers refer to the Great Depression. I didn't hear them refer to OPEC. But that had a lot to do with the disappointments and the stagflation of the late 1970s. OPEC was followed by tight money policies by all the central banks of Europe, United States, and Japan. And although the Minnesota boys, the new classical macroeconomists, told us that if these central banks made it clear to the public what they were going to do, and Mrs. Thatcher was certainly doing that in Britain, and Paul Volcker was doing that in the United States, and that they would stick to a tight money policy regardless of the consequences, then there wouldn't be any consequences because everybody would immediately disinflate wages and prices. Keynesians said that would not be true. They said that it would be, uh, you would succeed in disinflation, but it would be costly. Costly in jobs, costly in high unemployment, costly in uh, reductions in the growth of GNP or actual reduction in GNP. Who was right? The Keynesians were right. It was very costly. Indeed, Europe hasn't recovered yet. Mrs. Thatcher succeeded in uh, an anti-Keynesian administration of economic policy in raising unemployment to larger numbers than were existed in the uh, 20s and early 30s. And 13 or 14 percent unemployment in Britain. The Germans have fewer people employed now than they had employed in 1972. And they have 9 percent unemployment or something like that. They set the tone for all of Europe. It's a disaster area. It's a disaster. And future historians may refer to the 1980s as, for Europe anyway, the Second Great Depression. Exception Sweden. Exception Austria, I guess, where more reasonable, less doctrinaire policies have been followed. And will the Germans and the British do anything about it? No. No. They have done the Heinrich Brüning, Herbert Hoover stuff, trying to balance their budgets at low levels of economic activity. So we don't have to apologize. I mean, it's like the beauty contest. Look at the, look at the other candidate, and we'll get the prize. Now, the United States, it's true, uh, has recovered better than the uh, European countries. And why is that? That's because, first of all, Paul Volcker, for all his monetarism, is a pragmatic man. And in the late 1982, he gave up on monetarism. And he violated his monetarist targets and uh, turned the economy around. And then the Reagan administration came in with these vast supply-side tax cuts and deficits, vast fiscal stimulus, beyond the wildest dreams of any Keynesian administration in this country would ever have done or ever did. Now, they were supposed to be supply-side tax cuts, to be sure. And it was supposed to be a defense buildup, not for Keynesian reasons, but for international geopolitical reasons. But it worked the way the Keynesian textbook says it would. The only thing is, it's such an unbalanced dose of heavy fiscal stimulus, large budget deficits, and high interest rates to keep the fiscal stimulus from carrying the economy too fast, that we've got a terribly unbalanced recovery a vast amount of public debt increase, a vast amount of international debt increase, and uh, a trade deficit that uh, is out of this world. If any Democratic or Keynesian administration had come up with those results, they'd be crucified in the Wall Street Journal tomorrow morning. 
Uh, well, Keynes's book is being commemorated this year at a time when perhaps most economists uh, disagree with it. And many attack it as the root of error and evil. Dissenters and opponents still find it necessary to refute, not simply to ignore Keynes's point. I guess that in itself is a tribute, backhanded though it may be, to the book's importance in the history of economic thought. The least that can be said of it is that it raises significant questions, continuing relevance, and anyone doing or applying macroeconomics has to handle them. I just use that word, macroeconomics, and I suspect many of you are taking, have taken, will take a first economics course in college, and it will be divided between micro and macro. Well, Keynes is the originator of macro as a distinct topic of study. The terminology didn't exist in 1936. I guess it came along around 10 years later. One of Keynes's uh, young colleagues, the great economist Joan Robinson, called the subject she was helping to pioneer the theory of output as a whole. Standard economic theory of the day provided tools for analyzing quantities and prices of individual commodities in particular markets, industries, and sectors. What Keynes began was the use of formal theory and analytical models for explaining gross national product, GNP, and other economy-wide variables. This practice becomes second nature now, common to all macroeconomists on whatever side of the great debate. And it's also the common architecture of statistical econometric models whose forecasts and other results all of you read and hear about. Businesses, banks, brokers, government agencies have their own models and commercial consulting firms market their proprietary models and their findings. The Federal Reserve consults its own model and others before every meeting of its open market committee. And Congress and the White House depend on macroeconometric models in their tortured efforts to agree on the federal budget and so on. Keynes himself was skeptical of statistical implementation of his ideas. At that time, econometric methods were in their infancy and computers didn't exist. But Keynes' own theoretical model was ready-made for empirical applications of this kind. Most econometric models are still built largely on Keynesian specifications for the good reasons that if they're not, they don't work and they make bad forecasts. And most of you are therefore consumers of Keynesian economics, whether you know it or not, and whether you like it or not. At this symposium, where most of you in the audience are not professional economists, I think, you are looking, uh, someone yesterday said eavesdropping, on a continuing serial drama, the battle of ideas in macroeconomics. It's a pretty esoteric game. And only the participants understand its rules and the weapons that are used, and maybe they don't. The organizers have assembled several opponents of Keynesian economics, but they don't see eye to eye on what they are opposing and why. And they've assembled several sympathizers who don't see eye to eye on what they're defending and why, completely. I feel sorry for you. So I'm going to try to tell you what the argument is about and what it's not about. At the same time, of course, uh, uh, expounding my own position. I venture to say there are very few of you who have read the book we are commemorating here today. As a matter of fact, very few professional economists have read it. Even those economists who liberally and often scornfully sprinkle the adjective Keynesian through their writings. It's possible and even likely that a college student majoring in economics today will never be asked to open the book. After I retire from Yale, I'm, that'll even be true at Yale. <laughs> and we'll never open it. The same is true of a doctoral student. The general theory is a formidable book. And Keynes was a master of English prose, but although his style comes through brilliantly in several passages in this book, the exposition frequently is opaque and sometimes appears to be self-contradictory. 
and the overall impression is Delphi. For that reason, followers and critics usually take off from some condensed interpretations of Keynes, often more formal and mathematical than Keynes' own presentation. The genius of the book is that it generally turns out that the refinements or criticisms advanced by subsequent authors were in fact anticipated by the general theory, if you look back in it. Well, it's not surprising that a great work exerts influence without being read very much, or that a great author's name generates adjectives and nouns to describe accurately or inaccurately a set of ideas only loosely connected to the original or that sympathetic followers disagree with each other as to whose ideas truly reflect the master. Well, in Marxism, we have another example of the same phenomenon, perhaps stronger. Those of us who are proud or at least content to be called Keynesians today should not be expected to stand literally on a book written 50 years ago. At least two strands of modern Keynesianism are represented here. There are others, doubtless, and even within the two I refer to is considerable diversity. The two strands could be called in shorthand American and English, though there are devotees of each on both sides of the ocean. In America, the mainstream of macroeconomics developed after the Second World War is often labeled the neoclassical synthesis, which was mentioned in the citation a while ago. It should be called neo-Keynesian neoclassical synthesis. Anyway, it was an attempt to reconcile Keynesian macroeconomics and orthodox microeconomics at least to put each in its proper domain, domain. Keynes himself said, perhaps with exaggeration, I think, that he has no quarrel with the way the capitalist market economy allocates the goods, the services and resources that it employs. His quarrel is that it doesn't employ all of them. Uh, Paul Samuelson, for whom I'm uh, pinch hitting here, was a major architect of the synthesis. And he's referred to me as a partner in this crime. In my biased opinion, a good non-technical exposition of, the main, of mainstream Mac American macroeconomic theory and policy is the 1962 report of President Kennedy's Council of Economic Advisors, on which I serve. I'm afraid it's out of print. Um, in your library. No. In Keynes's home town, home university, some of Keynes's own young colleagues and disciples established a somewhat different tradition, interpreting the book as a thorough and radical rejection of previous economic doctrine, micro and macro. I won't try to describe that further. Jeff Harkart spoke for himself. But anyway, today, and specifically at this conference, he and I have enemies to unite against. <clears throat> In my uh, American interpretation, Keynesian theory and policy refer mainly to demand side phenomena. Advanced capitalist industrial economies are susceptible to deficiencies in aggregate demand. Periods when the national output of goods and services is limited, not by the capacity of the economy to produce them, but by the shortage of willing customers. Lacking sales prospects, businesses need fewer workers. Members of the labor force who can't hold or find jobs are thus involuntarily unemployed. And likewise, productive physical capital of industry is underutilized, also unemployed. These conditions pervade the economy in such times. They're not confined to particular industries whose declines are balanced by expansions elsewhere. Those things happen during prosperity. This malady, deficient demand, was of course virulent and epidemic in the depression. But in the recession phases of more moderate business cycles, we still experience it and can observe the symptoms of the Keynesian malady. The prescription follows from the diagnosis and from the view that the wasteful and unpleasant effects of the disease have no redeeming therapeutic value. And some economists have thought that depressions are good for you, you know, hard, hardships uh, build character and get rid of dead wood and all that. 
the prescription that the government should add to the economy-wide demand for goods and services. That's what it is. Either directly by spending money itself or indirectly. There are two indirect ways. One is to add to the spendable resources of the public by cutting taxes or augmenting transfer payments, like unemployment insurance or Social Security. The other is monetary policy, giving private businesses, households, more ability and more incentive to spend by augmenting the availability of credit and lowering interest rate. I want to emphasize that Keynesian prescription and diagnosis are two-sided. There are times when the problem is the reverse, that there's too much demand for the capacity of the economy, and inflation is the danger, not unemployment. In that case, you should put the uh, remedies in reverse, pretty obviously. And the failure of Johnson to do that in 1966 was responsible for the inflation of those years. If all of this sounds obvious and innocuous to most of you, it's because it is obvious and innocuous. That's why. Only economists brainwashed to believe that nothing bad can ever happen in market economies, find it incredible. Well, I'm going to return to the issues they raise. And right now, I want to make clear what Keynesian economics is not, at least American mainstream Keynesian economics. I do that because, especially when I talk to non-economists, I find they have a lot of ideas about what Keynesian economics is that are inaccurate. First, contrary to popular impression, contrary even to the impressions given by some economists who should know better, Keynesian does not denote liberal in the political and ideological meaning that word has in this country in this century, not in the 19th century British usage. So, Keynesian and liberal are not synonyms. Keynesian macroeconomic policies may have been more congenial to liberal politicians than to conservatives. Although, as I said, every federal administration in this country since World War II has employed them in some degree. But advocacy of those policies does not commit anyone to the welfare state, to large government activity, to regulatory interventions in industry, agriculture, and labor to support of trade unions, to redistributive taxation, to strict environmental protection, or to any other planks uh, generally associated with liberal politics. Does not imply opposition to those planks either. Those are simply separate issues. And Keynesian macro medicines can work within broad limits. However, those other issues are resolved, whether in a liberal or conservative direction. The anger and consternation with which American conservatives have viewed, in particular businessmen and their organizations, have viewed Keynesian economics from 1936 on to this day has always been a puzzle. Keynes was not personally anti-capitalist, nor was the message of his book. Far from suggesting that capitalism was doomed by irreparable structural flaws, as leftists contended then and now, Keynes thought that capitalism could be saved without radical surgery. Second, again contrary to popular impression, Keynesian economics is not a recipe for wild deficit spending. Whether budget deficits are appropriate or not depends on the state of the economy and on the stance of monetary policy. Many Keynesians, including this one, would like to see the federal budget in balance or in surplus. When and if but only when and if the Federal Reserve would contrive low enough interest rates to sustain full prosperity. The advantage to the nation would be that future generations inherit more productive capital, either at home or abroad, and less public debt. Keynesian economics did challenge the wisdom of the blind rule that the budget should be balanced every year. <clears throat> Challenge that because it's macroeconomically perverse and fiscally futile to raise taxes or cut spending during recessions and depressions, as I already said. Well, Jim Buchanan says, and he's going to say, I bet, this afternoon, that Keynes let the genie out of the bottle. 
the balanced budget norm, <clears throat> was the only discipline restraining politicians' irresponsible, irrepressible propensities to spend. Well, from 1946 to 1980 in this country, the ratio of federal debt to the GNP fell from 120% right after the Second World War to 23%. And then came our first explicitly anti-Keynesian administration, <clears throat> explicitly and consciously rejecting the failed theories and policies of the previous half century. And under that administration's auspices, the debt-GNP ratio has risen to 38% in five years. And I suppose Jim Buchanan will blame that on Keynes, too. The third Keynesian macroeconomics has been charged with a pro-consumption anti-investment bias, thus favoring the present at the expense of the future. I really dealt with that in the last point, but I want to drive the point home. Martin Feldstein, the formerly the chairman of President Reagan's CEA, made this blanket indictment in his statement to Congress on assuming office. That is a canard. In the first place, it's no service to future generations to waste in idleness the labor and capacity that could produce more goods and services, much of which would be invested and saved. In the second place, it was Keynesian economists who put in place the low deficit fiscal policies and the tax incentives for investment. And it's the current anti-Keynesian administration that has put our economy on a consumption binge and has now repealed those investment incentives. Fourth, again contrary to widespread impression, Keynesianism is not fiscalism. When the word monetarism was coined and the anti-Keynesian protagonist of the movement questioned the efficacy of fiscal policy, the media jumped to the convenient symmetry of calling Keynesian non-monetarists fiscalists. Well, if you're not a monetarist, you must be a fiscalist. Well, Keynes thought fiscal measures could be used to affect aggregate demand, especially in deep depressions when interest rates were difficult to move and responses to their movements might be weak. But he thought monetary policy matters too, certainly in normal times. And this has certainly been the consistent stance of the post-war American mainstream Keynesian economists I believe contrary to what Axel said yesterday. Fifth, Keynesians are not advocates of large government budgets, balanced or unbalanced. If, like J.K. Galbraith, someone personally believes that the public sector is undernourished in the United States, that's a judgment he or she has reached on quite separate grounds. It's not derived from Keynesian principles. If, like Milton Friedman, an anti-Keynesian believes that the public sector is a leviathan devouring the economy, that too is a judgment reached on grounds logically quite distinct from any views about macroeconomic policy or theory. According to the neoclassical synthesis, fiscal and monetary policies can be used to stay close to the path of high employment growth, whether government budgets, expenditures, and taxes are big or small relative to the size of the economy. Government expenditures of any type should be judged by considering their opportunity cost to the society. Is it socially worthwhile to direct resources, divert resources that could satisfy private demands to this or that governmental program? We elect legislatures, legislators to make those choices about national priorities. And that test will not fix any permanent percentage of national output as the right size of the public sector because pub priorities depend on the circumstances of the day and on the public and private activities competing for the resources. These are important issues, but they're not the issues involved in debates about macroeconomics or Keynesian theory. Sixth, while Keynesians regard involuntary unemployment as a grave economic waste and a social evil, they certainly do not think that all actual unemployment is involuntary, or even that all involuntary unemployment is amenable to Keynesian treatment. Keynes recognized the inevitability of frictional unemployment. Industries, regions, and occupations rise and fall. It takes time for workers to move from where the jobs were, where they are, and will be. 
Some workers are voluntarily unemployed while they search for the jobs they really like. Some are involuntarily idle because unions and on occasion government regulations set real wages too high. In underdeveloped countries where both physical and human capital, education and skill are scarce, there are very few high productivity jobs. And they pay such high wages relative to the livings available from subsistence agriculture that people crowd into urban shanty towns to gamble on the remote chance that they can land a modern sector job. Keynesian remedies are not the cure for that kind of unemployment. Or those kind. But when unemployment rises from 4% in 29 to 25% in 1933, or from 6% in 79 to 11% in 1982, or from 4% in 78 in the UK to 13% in 1986, or from 2% in 1972 in West Germany to 9% now, it's beyond belief that the labor force has become suddenly lazy, incompetent, and immobile. I want sixth to emphasize how limited is the domain further indicate how limited is the domain of macroeconomics. For long run trends in living standards, for differences among nations in living standards, supply is the dominant side of the story. Productivity per worker and its growth are decisive. Over the decades and between countries, differences in the rates of unemployment and underutilization will account for much less than differences in capacity to produce. The natural forces of adjustment stressed by the classical and neoclassical economists may work, but they take a long time. Or it may be that Keynesian remedies will consciously or unconsciously be adopted to bring eventually demand up to supply. That's why economists of the neoclassical synthesis, though not exclusive American in nationality, subscribe to and indeed developed neoclassical theory of growth, modeling long-run trends in terms of the same factors that other economists would stress, population, saving, capital accumulation, education, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Our formula can be put very succinctly. Supply does call the tune in the long run, but it's demand in the short run. In business cycles, demand creates its own supply, so long as that doesn't exceed potential capacity. But in the long run, supply does create its own demand, says law. A similar disclaimer applies in the realm of policy. Keynesians don't believe their fiscal and monetary prescriptions for stabilizing the economy in the United States, Japan, and Western Europe can solve the problems of poverty in Bangladesh and Tanzania or even significantly speed up the growth of productivity in advanced countries. These tasks are much more difficult, require a whole different set of policies, a menu of supply-side measures. To be sure, effective and well-chosen policies of short-run demand management can help. For example, a tight fiscal easy money mix of policies in the United States right now would be much better for growth over the long run than the loose fiscal tight money mix to which we've drifted in the last few years. Seventh, small economies tightly linked to the rest of the world in commodity trade and capital transactions have little opportunity to determine their own macroeconomic policy and fate. Minnesota can't buck the trends of the national economy, recessionary or inflationary. Its prosperity relative to other states will depend on the productivity and competitiveness of the workers and businesses of the state. Same is true of Belgium within the common market. Keynes's book assumed a closed, self-contained economy without international transaction. It applied better to the United States at the time than to his own country. Today it applies better to the seven major economic summit countries taken as a group than to any one of them alone, even the U.S. The lesson is still the same. World prosperity depends on adequate demand stimulus emanating from somewhere. Some stimulus originating in the US, for example, will spill into Europe and Japan, and has done, into demand for their exports. 
But not everybody can enjoy export-driven prosperity, or though, although the uh, people who run the economies of Germany and Japan seem to think so. Contrary to widespread impression, Keynesianism is not fiscalism. When the word monetarism was, and I gave you that already. Sorry, got a little out of order here. I return now to the quarrels about theory and policy. As I suggested above, uh, orthodox theorists find it inconceivable that markets could fail in the manner and to the extent that Keynesians allege. In the classical, neoclassical, now new classical traditions, markets are supposed to clear, i.e. to equate supply and demand, and prices do that job. If there's excess demand at an arbitrary price, a higher price will discourage demand and induce supply enough to clear the market. If there's unemployment, wages will fall. Idle workers will be competing for jobs and lower the wages and give employers thus incentive to hire more workers. And if business investment is too low to use the saving the country offers to finance it, another kind of price, interest rates, will fall until investment demand is equated to saving supply. Fifty years ago, Keynes's opponents were confident that adjustments of this kind would work although most of them admitted that it would take time. Well, they really had to admit that because the Depression was right there before their eyes. Now, the counter-revolutionary critics of Keynesian economics think those adjustments are virtually instantaneous. That's not because of any new evidence that the economic system works that way. It's just because of the increased attachment of those theorists to a priori assumptions and their logical implications. So they interpret business fluctuations not as departures from equilibrium, during which excess supplies and demands persist, and not as fluctuations in demand relative to a fairly constant supply potential. They interpret them as moving equilibrium, during which supply and demand curves both shift around, but prices move to keep supply and demand virtually always equal. Applied to labor markets, this approach rules out involuntary unemployment. So the conclusion is the unemployed really don't want jobs. They're voluntarily staying out. In my opinion, the explanations contrived to make this theory of economic fluctuations fit the observed facts are ridiculously unbelievable. The Keynesian explanation that demand and supply are not balanced, that unemployment and excess supply capacity arise from a shortfall of aggregate demand relative to capacity fit the facts without straining common sense. I think you can understand the implied differences in policy between these two views. If you think the problem is shortage of aggregate demand, then you prescribe measures to increase demand. Confident that businesses will be happy to produce and sell more goods, and the workers will be glad to take additional jobs when they're offered. But if you think the economy is always in equilibrium, supply and demand, you see no need or any social benefit from any such intervention. And you think that government's attempt to increase demand is just going to result in inflation, raise prices. <clears throat> Considering the, consider the following thought experiment, just on a common sense basis. Imagine. Let's be thinking of a particular year, I don't know, 1989. Imagine two alternative scenarios for the economy that year. In scenario one, in, no, in scenario two, the rate of dollar spending on goods and services is significantly larger than in scenario one. That's the only difference between the two as-if scenarios in 1989. Let's say it's 10% larger in scenario two than one, to be dramatic. Uh, you can imagine the scenarios differ because of fiscal and monetary policy or because of world events that are not policy related, either way. And it could be either the uh, quantity of money that's involved or the velocity of money, I don't care. But the rate of dollar spending is bigger in one case than in the other. Now, let's consider three possible outcomes. A. Prices are 10% higher. 
If that's so, then output will be just the same. The volume will be just the same as before, as in one scenario as the other. So if prices are 10 percent higher, the prices will take the whole amount of the increase in dollar spending. B, output is 10 percent higher and prices are not changed, just the polar opposite of A. And C, both output and prices are higher in two than in one, both of them, each by amounts less than 10 percent. Of course, the two percentages have to add up to 10 percent because that's the total difference that has to be absorbed. Well, the anti-Keynesian answer is A. A vulgar Keynesian answer in some textbooks is B. But what's Keynes' own answer? It's C. That's the correct Keynesian answer. That's the answer anyone taking an SAT test would choose anyway. That, <laughs> that middle ground is the common sense answer. It can be elaborated to say that the shift of the impulse between prices and quantities depends on the state of the economy. In a deep recession or depression with very high unemployment and a lot of excess capacity, the answer might well approach B. In a tight economy like the Vietnam War situation with no reservoirs of labor and capacity, the answer might well approach A, the monetarist answer. Thus, those two answers are special cases of C. Well, Keynes called his book the general theory. I return to the question whether the economy in the absence of policy interventions has effective natural adjustment mechanisms that restore full employment once some disturbing shock has lowered employment and output. One of Keynes's bright ideas was to point out that the demand movements of employment and output themselves lower aggregate demand. Workers and businesses that receive smaller incomes spend less. It's as simple as that. This effect is in the same negative direction as the assumed initial shock. It magnifies that impulse. Some of you may remember or will encounter, even now, the multiplier from your student days. And that's what that's about. Thus, if price, and that includes wages and interest rates, are, are uh, weak in their responses or have weak or slow effects in, in uh, reviving demand, the decline will be reversed, if at all, only after a long time, because the multiplier has a chance to work and to magnify the initial downward shock. Furthermore, Keynes had, and Keynesians still have, good reason to doubt the efficacy of price deflation as a means of restoring prosperity. Lower prices may make creditors better off and more willing to spend. And that was uh, the Pigou effect, a real balance effect. So when uh, Keynes said that uh, deflation wouldn't do any good, the response was, well, it will do some good. It will encourage consumption to have prices go down because it will make people think they're richer. Vasily Leontiev said, if prices go down enough, then I'll be able to buy the whole GNP with one dime. Well. Uh, as a practical matter, you have to remember that deflation like that saddles debtors with higher burden of debt as well as making creditors think possibly that they're somewhat better off. The process of, so it's really, uh, from a practical point of view, a pretty weak read to, uh, to uh, pin the hopes for self-adjustment of the economy on. Anyway, the process of lowering prices generates deflationary expectations. Well, if uh, prices are going down at 6% a year, as they were during the early 30s, that's equivalent to an increase in the real interest rate. So by waiting, you're going to be able to buy things cheaper than you are now. And holding money is uh, gaining you. Holding money and not spending it is gaining you uh, six percent in uh, purchasing power per year as the prices go down. So um, uh, that effect of that is just the opposite of the adjustment that's needed, the perverse direction. So it's quite possible that the uh, scenario of deflation is, uh, is not a stable one, or at least it's not a fast one, that's going to remedy unemployment very rapidly. 
History tells us that deflationary times are generally hard times. And the same can be said, as the early 80s told us, of disinflationary times, exemplified by the recessions and stagnations that have accompanied the decline in inflation rates since 79. So as Professor Leon Hoofford said yesterday, Keynesian difficulties, lapses from full employment equilibrium because of deficient demand, I think this is what he said, can occur even if prices and money wages are completely flexible. Although Keynes did not think they were completely rigid, he didn't think they were completely flexible either. But just because he didn't think flexibility would solve the problem, he thought, as Jeffrey Harcourt reminded us the other day, that it would be desirable to have stable money wages. Or we might say money wages growing at the normal rate of growth of labor productivity. So Keynes thought government should have a wage price policy or an incomes policy, people would call it these days, and that would make it more surely possible to reduce involuntary unemployment by measures that increase the quantity or the velocity of money. Uh, now, I agree that Keynes made a couple of mistakes in uh, tactics in uh, presenting his ideas. And in doing so, he raised some red flags which have uh, offended neoclassical theorists for 50 years and resulted in the diff many of the difficulties we have now. The first error was to um, call the underemployment situation an equilibrium. That's a sort of sacred work in economics, and you don't use it uh, uh, casually. Well, there's several ideas of equilibrium. One of them is uh, just supply equals demand, but obviously unemployment equilibrium can't be equilibrium in that sense because its nature is that supply exceeds demand in some markets. And it may mean a situation in which uh, expectations are fulfilled so that what people think is going to happen actually does happen. Uh, that's not a suitable idea for Keynes to use because he emphasized, I believe, the diversity of expectations and the uncertainty, the essential uncertainty of the world, which would make it impossible for anybody to have really very definite expectations. And he estimated, he made a point of the fact that savers and lenders may have different expectations from those that apply to borrowers and investors, and that that may create some kind of impasse. So I don't think he wants to say his situation is an equilibrium in that sense either. The third meaning of equilibrium is that a situation which goes on without change. Well, uh, that's where this uh, overemphasized de debate about rigidity of money wages comes in. It's not going to go out without any change because it's sort of bound to produce some decline in wages as a result, and prices, some deflation. So he shouldn't have called it equilibrium, and it just doesn't matter for practical purposes. If we have long periods of, uh, protracted periods of uh, high unemployment and low production, uh, it's just as bad from a practical point of view whether you call it equilibrium or disequilibrium. Uh, the other mistake, which has already been mentioned, is that, he, that Keynes chose to play the game on the opponent's home ground using their rules. And their rules were pure competition, a situation in which everybody is a price taker. That is, prices are made in auction markets, and nobody sets them. No human hands touch them. They just come out of, of quote, the market and no individual can do anything to set his own price. Well, uh, Keynes talks a lot in a different way, in, informally in his book. When he talks about wages, he acts as if employed workers do have some power over the actual, what actually happens to wages, some defense against being dis replaced by 
unemployed workers who are willing at the factory gate to take over their jobs at lower wages. And he would have done much better to use monopoly, monopolistic competition, imperfect competition, as the micro base of his uh, macro theory. And I believe Les Thoreau is going to correct that uh, mistake definitively uh, this evening. So I won't go further into it, except to say I'm not that fascinated with the idea that macro theory has to be based in a pure way on, on micro foundations. Uh, attempts to do so in modern th theory are meaningless because, as Axel said yesterday, they involve assuming that the macro economy is a Robinson Crusoe economy, so that the uh, behavior of, the, of a single individual is uh, the same as that of the whole economy. Now that bypasses, dodges, evades all the problems of coordination that are essential in macroeconomics. So uh, uh, macroeconomics uh, is a shortcut uh, method in which you try to uh, write down some, some hypotheses and equations, relationships, that are plausible uh, considering both what we know about the way individuals, firms, consumers, workers behave, and which also pay some uh, reasonable, empirically related attention to aggregation over different kinds of agents. And uh, there's no reason to outlaw that particular method of going about uh, economics or macroeconomics because the complete generality of, uh, of theory in economics is empty of any uh, empirically interesting propositions or any that could be used for policy purposes. That's why we have macroeconomics in the first place because full-blown general equilibrium theory, which tries to pay attention to the immense diversity of the economy, just doesn't lead anywhere to any definite conclusions about the things we're interested in. Now, at the beginning, I gave some um, uh, biased history in defense of, uh, of Keynesian economics. And I think that the profession is coming around. Uh, I notice uh, younger people writing articles, testing the implications of uh, the new classical macro models against uh, those of Keynesian models. And I notice Keynesian models winning uh, increasing percentage of the time in those tests. And I notice that uh, there are an increasing number of young economists who have been disenchanted with the unrealism of the anti-Keynesian models, macroeconomic models. I also think that, as somebody said yesterday, the views of economists have a lot to do with what goes on in the world. And Keynesian economics took its blows during uh, the 70s when uh, things seemed to be going badly. And now things are going badly for the anti-Keynesian policies and the intellectual foundations of those policies in the 1980s. It seems like the 1980s are in some sense a more normal period, uh, free of the uh, extraordinary shocks like OPEC that occurred in the 1970s. And it, they look, what's going on looks a, a lot more uh, a lot more Keynesian than superficially what was going on in the 1970s. Uh, that's the justification for the word renaissance, which I uh, put in the title of this paper before I wrote the paper. <laughs> Always a problem to live up to the title. But uh, I do think there will be a new synthesis. And uh, that new synthesis will come. I'm not as pessimistic as uh, uh, Leon Hufford. And the new synthesis will have some good ideas out of the new classical counter-revolution. The good idea we'll have is one that is congenial to Keynes, 
And that's the idea that uh, p policy has to be both workable and believed by the agents. It's no good to have a policy that agents in the economy, businesses and households, believe if it won't work, even given that they believe it. That's no good. But it all may also be no good to have a policy which will work unless people have confidence in it. Now, Keynes is very clear about that. And uh, it is difficult to sustain that combination. But perhaps we did that for a fleeting period in the uh, uh, 50s and especially in the early 60s in the United States. I think so. And we have to restore that somehow. Uh, but the part of the new classical macroeconomics that we don't need is the uh, assumption that uh, everything, the Panglossian assumption that everything is always working out for the best because it would be irrational if it didn't. You know, that, that's, that's futile uh, kind of uh, social science. So I think uh, we will have a new synthesis. It won't be the same as the one that I participated in in the uh, 50s and 60s, but uh, macroeconomics will be the better for it. Thank you very much. Henry Wallach was such an example. Huh? Henry Wallach was, at least for a while, he was Henry Wallach, possibly also an example. How is he doing? Uh, not too well. We're very grateful to Professor Tobin for that very stimulating presentation. I'm uh, informed by Professor Buchanan that he would like to have an opportunity to make comments, so I will call on him at this time. I would like to make four, four separate points. Uh, first point is I think we ought to get the record straight. I think that Jim Tobin may have left the impression that the economic establishment, in fact, was in opposition to the policy program that Keynes was recommending. That is categorically not correct. The University of Chicago group, there was a petition signed, there were uh, meetings and everything else that's been well documented that were strongly supportive of expansionary fiscal and monetary policy as early as 1931, 32, 33. I'm sure Jim won't agree, disagree with me, but I do think it's worthwhile to get the record straight on that. Second point I make, I, I think it is totally misleading
to try to talk about the size of the debt in relationship to the gross national product. And he did cite a figure on that. Uh, you can get to tomorrow or next week, you can reduce the ratio of the public debt to the size of the product by simply inflating it out of sight, which is what we did in the 1970s. So that is a, a grossly misleading measure. The, the third point I would make re relates to uh, uh, Jim Tobin's uh, separate scenarios uh, when you, in 1989 when you have a 10 percent higher rate of spending. I think he left out a fourth possibility that under certain expectationary settings you could well have a price increase far more than the 10 percent and actually unemployment in that setting if you had the right expectational situation. And the fourth point I would make, uh, he referred and said that um, the big models did not work uh, unless they uh, used the basic Keynesian analytical framework. I would simply add that to the best of my knowledge, they don't work even if you do. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Buchanan. I will. I will ask if Professor Leinhoven would like to make comments since he was also referred to in the course of Professor Tobin's presentation. Well, uh, I think uh, Professor Tobin was uh, rather kind to me so that I, I uh, in that sense, I, I just as well shut up. But um, <laughs> um, he, he, he ended on a note of optimism. Uh, a bit uh, different from, uh, from how I ended yesterday. Uh, that's probably because he's not a Scandinavian. <laughs> I, I, I'm temperamentally uh, not made for that kind of optimism and, and I don't see a quick end to the confusion and the, the incoherence of the state of macroeconomics right now. And I think that many of you, uh, I know that there are teachers from lots of different schools here today who have to stand in, ta in the classrooms and uh, try to make sense of the current state of macroeconomics to, to undergraduates. Uh, I think many of you must, uh, must uh, share this frustration and see no clear lead out of the situation. Uh, one reaction I also had was uh, Jim Tobin, towards the end, uh, voiced perhaps in passing the kind of comments that I hear more and more, uh, namely uh, people say Keynesianism is coming back because the other guys failed too. Uh, and I don't think that's, uh, uh, that is going to be a sufficient, uh, sufficient basis for uh, good cheer about the state of the, of the subject. Um, although it's true uh, that they are failing too, uh, that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the fashion bubble of new classical economics uh, is being pricked, I think. Um, so uh, the question is, at, at, uh, in what direction are we going to find uh, a more viable synthesis? Uh, if I had a very clear-cut solution to that, I would be marketing it for a price, uh, perhaps <laughs> in the form of a best-selling textbook or something like that. Uh, the, the reason I haven't uh, written a textbook is I don't think I have a best-selling recipe. Um, I think one element of it uh, is likely to be uh, this emphasis on monetary regimes that uh, I tried to uh, uh, advance here yesterday, and uh, uh, which is of course not original uh, with me. Um, and. Um, it is going to be, I think, uh, make a difference. Uh, to take a specific point in Tobin's talk, uh, he mentioned that uh, the response of the economy to uh, stimulus uh, would depend upon uh, uh, the state of aggregate activity. And he suggested 
uh, that uh, at low levels of activity the, the response would be Keynesians and at high, high levels of activity would be monetarist. And this is of course sort of a suggested compromise uh, that we had with us already 20 years ago. Um, I think there's the following thing wrong with it, or there's, the, there's one thing wrong with the models out of which this compromise came. And that is that at a time, and we were discussing this in the context of the ISLM model that is uh, familiar to, uh, to all, at least all the teachers here. And uh, in the 60s, say, we tended to take the arguments from that model in, in two stages. And the first stage, you discussed the determination of money income. And you said, well, uh, you can get an increase in money income either by shifting LM or by shifting IS and so on. Uh, given the, at the second stage, you says, given that I got, let's say, an increase in money income, uh, let's ask how it breaks down into a price and a quantity uh, uh, adjustment and you would then consult uh, some Phillips co uh, curve construction to, to see how that breakdown would come about. You were then later surprised when that way of doing it, doing the second stage, uh, completely fouled you up in the 70s. Well, I think the, this two-stage way of talking about it uh, was wrong to begin with because it did not make the distinction that I tried to rub home yesterday about nominal and real impulses. Um, I think that with a nominal impulse, given the state of activity in the system, whether high or low, you'd expect uh, more of a price response, less of a quantity response, uh, than for uh, fiscal or real impulse at the same level of activity. And uh, uh, what kind of impulse you get most frequently will depend upon how you have arranged uh, uh, your monetary system. Uh, perhaps I was, I was one la last line. Uh, it occurred to me after I left the podium yesterday that I should have explained to people that I'm not advocating a return to the gold standard with all this talk about convertibility. I don't think there is a road back to this particular uh, arrangement. Thank you, Professor Leonovit. Professor Harcourt has asked for a time to make a comment. Uh, I'd just uh, like to make a couple of comments. Uh, I reviewed Jim Tobin's 1980 book, which was a survey of uh, macroeconomics as it then was, and uh, I finished it with an eloquent plea for all good men to come to the party and uh, form a united front, and I was glad to see that symmetry has returned when Jim returned the, uh, the compliment today. And I'd like to say that uh, on policy issues and on many theoretical issues, we are at, uh, at one. Uh, what we try to do and what is left in Cambridge, England, and the very few uh, old-fashioned Keynesians like myself that are are left is to take a structure which is not dissimilar uh, to what uh, James Tobin uh, outlined, but um, we do also, uh, in discussing policy, and I'm sure he would agree with this, uh, try to make a distinction, uh, a distinction which originally came from Kaletsky, who, orig who independently discovered the main propositions of the general theory, that from a political point of view, there is a world of difference between getting to full employment and sustaining it. And in part of uh, Professor Tobin's talk today, he outlined how uh, the neoclassical synthesis school um, uh, proceeded to model uh, those particular problems which have much more to do uh, with, with the, uh, the longer run development of the economy. And it is there where there's been some uh, parting of the ways uh, on, on emphasis on what are the important theoretical and empirical relationships to make. That's the first point I want to make. The second point I'd like to make is that uh, if we are going to use macroeconomic frameworks, and I applaud uh, his emphasis on that, and also his aside that we should not worry ourselves too silly about getting rigorous and precise microeconomic foundations. After all, 
as Keynes himself said implicitly and Marx said explicitly, the macroeconomic foundations of microeconomics may be just as important, if not more important, than the, 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 the microeconomic foundations of macroeconomics, that if we are going to do that, we, we, we should, um, we should uh, bring back an emphasis in our, in our models on not only the aggregate demand side, but on the aggregate supply function, which Keynes thought, as I tried to say yesterday, was e possibly even more important uh, than the aggregate demand side in explaining certain phases of the, uh, uh, of the operation of the economy. And had, with few exceptions, had it not been the fact that with few exceptions that the aggregate supply function as conceived of by Keynes and modified by people like Sidney Weintraub and Laurie Tarshus, had it not almost disappeared from mainstream discussions, then I don't think the Keynesians would have been put so much on the defensive in explaining what was going wrong with the world after the Vietnam War uh, mistakes, the OPEC shocks, the breakdown of Bretton Woods, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and the, uh, the fact that in the early 70s, the world trade cycle for one synchronized so that we boomed like mad, uh, commodity prices really shot up and uh, with an aggregate supply function approach and the distinction which uh, Jim Tobin referred to between how you price in industrialized sections of the, of the community and how you price in the raw material sections, Keynesians could have made a very good fist of explaining what was going on and would not need it to have yielded the ground to the rather unreal as if um, models uh, associated with the new classical macroeconomics. So in summing up, I mean, I say, I, I think we were privileged to hear such a sterling defense of 50 years of a, a, a Harvard uh, freshman, I think, is, is that, yeah, I never understand American terminology. We call them first years. Uh, 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 50 years when he was handed the general theory up until the day where he himself has played such an important part in establishing the way in which Keynesian theory is thought about within the American context. Thank you, Professor Harcourt. Professor Bruner has indicated that he would like to make a comment, and then we will allow Professor Tobin a moment to respond, or if he has a, no lengthy response, we have, perhaps we can take at least one of some very excellent questions that we've gotten from the floor. So, Professor Bruner. Uh, one or the other point. Uh, first, uh, the point which already Axel took up in connection with uh, Jim Tobin's comments and comparisons of the fate of the alternative uh, views or hypotheses, Keynesian, non-Keynesian, monetarist, non-monetarist, or non-non uh, whatsoever. Um, the, his point was that uh, the non-Keynesian or monetarist or whatever you want to call the animal uh, view uh, suffered uh, serious uh, problems in the last years. And what I find interesting in this context is the following, namely that uh, in many discussions or what I've seen or read or heard uh, is uh, that it is not very clearly stated sometimes and I would be very interested if it would be very specifically stated what specific propositions are in trouble in this context. Uh, one example, for instance, uh, Professor Robert Gordon made in his update, which he sa regularly sends out, uh, uh, pretty much noise about the velocity behavior. That the observed velocity behavior of the last four or five years simply was inconsistent with monetarist analysis. Well, I think uh, we have to be very careful. I find it a very interesting and useful example. Uh, in one sense, it does create the problem for a very specific monetarist proposition. The proposition which is, uh, which is troubled thereby is uh, actually the dominant nominal impulse hypothesis. Uh, another one, incidentally, which uh, 11 years ago, uh, uh, Alan Meltzer and I made very explicitly clear that we think that's one hypothesis which uh, should be revised and uh, abandoned, as a matter of fact. Uh, another point is um, uh, the following, that Milton Friedman in the late uh, 50s 
uh, somewhere in one of these, I think it may have been in the preface to the studies in the quantity theory of money, uh, indicated that the crucial significant proposition of monetarism was uh, the stabi stability of the demand function for money, which is related to the problem raised by Bob Gordon. I, at the time, uh, objected quite uh, strongly to that, that this was not the crucial fundamental property, and uh, I have still held on today that this is not the crucial fundamental property in this context at all. Uh, it is significant uh, in uh, one respect, again, if you want to adhere to the dominant uh, uh, nominal impulse hypothesis. But for other aspects, say, for instance, as a basis to derive a monetary rule, it is uh, neither necessary nor sufficient. As a matter of fact, uh, in this context, you can show that uh, if, the run if the velocity behavior is approximately a random walk, then any systematic feedback rule, for instance, is suboptimal compared to a constant monetary growth rate in terms of the variance it produces uh, about nominal GNP. So the issue which uh, I simply want to emphasize in this context that uh, it would be useful if uh, we sort of mutually, when we attend to these issues, are a bit more explicit in terms of specifying the nature of propositions which we are attending to and which are in trouble and which are not really affected by whatever observations we make. The second point is the following. Namely, that uh, uh, on policy questions, Jim Tobin, I understood, I may not be quite sure that I understood correctly, listening, that uh, there has been a change in policy patterns more to the Keynesian directions in recent years. Well, uh, let's look at the various policy patterns in this context. Budget policy, well, we have one party which seems to me essentially to make hay on the political hayloft by concentrating on spending and spending uh, programs. And another party which seems to make hay on their hayloft by concentrating on tax reductions. As a matter of fact, an interesting example in this respect. Alan Meltzer told me years ago when I was young, like six years ago, that uh, he had long conversations with Jack Kemp. And these conversations came to an abrupt and final halt when uh, Alan tried to argue with him that the issue was to a large extent the size of the budget and the size of expenditures and so on. And Jack Kemp made unmistakably clear that he had the slightest interest about spending, whether they were large or whether small. This was a hayloft of the Democrats on which they had made a whole lot of hay. And on the other side, I mean, it was time for the Republicans to make some hay, as we say in Switzerland, and uh, to have a sellable product, and tax reductions were a sellable product, and never mind what happened to spending. Now, under the circumstances, our budget policy, I would argue, can be called policy, but it's only policy in Mr. Magoo's sense. You may, some of you may remember Mr. Magoo, who used to say there's no reason, it's just policy. Now, uh, so I don't see anything particular Keynesian in, uh, in uh, this context, and this relates to a point which Lester Thoreau made yesterday, which I fully agree, and uh, elaborated quite some years ago in some papers, namely about the role of ideas and political events, that to a good extent, not quite completely, because Karl Marx and his influence is a or something going in the opposite direction, but to a good extent. Uh, if politicians accept Keynesian policies, say for instance, and that also holds of course for monetarist policies, that's exactly the same game in this respect. If they accept such kind of policies, it's not because they are convinced about Keynesian analysis. What they are convinced of about their uh, political action which is useful for their purposes, and then they adopt certain ideas because this is very handy and very useful. And that's exactly also what happened with the supply siders. It simply happened that what the supply siders had to offer fitted very nicely in the political program Jack Kemp wanted to pursue anyway. 
in, because he thought that this would augment his political status and his political marketing and so on. So uh, in this context, uh, the whole aspect of budgetary policy, I would argue, is not really so much Keynesian at all, as uh, simply an expression of our political drift which uh, we experience and uh, which neither the Keynesians or the monetarists I think can be too happy about if we look at the future prospect of that pattern. Uh, so similarly, it seems to me with monetary policy. There is more drift than policy there and not really much Keynesian about it either. It's a kind of a policy, again in Mr. Magoo's sense, where we simply react from day to day, whatever the perception seems to guide them and the political interests seem to guide them. We don't know what will happen in three months. The policymakers have not the faintest idea what they will do in three months. And in this respect, a basic idea of Keynes is just a problem of pervasive uncertainty. And if we have institutions which contribute to the basic uncertainty, then it seems to me that just in the basic spirit of Keynes to lower this uncertainty, we might just as appropriately ask ourselves what kind of institutional changes would contribute to lower this uncertainty, which particularly is coming also from the policymaking side itself. Thank you very much, Professor Brunner. Feeling somewhat like a television newsman, I'm afraid once again the tyranny of the clock must impose itself and terminate this very fascinating discussion. I want uh, Professor Tobin to have an opportunity to make a response to these comments, uh, which we will be sure to get to at a, the next panel discussion we are able to arrange. We also have some excellent questions from the floor, and I intend to take those up as well. Uh, but I'm afraid we must uh, adjourn for the present, uh, reconvening for Professor Ronald Hayden Preston's uh, presentation at 1.30, uh, prelude to begin at 1.20. Thank you very much.